Good morning, everyone. It's good to see y'all here, right? Third Sunday of Advent, our theme is joy. Some of you are looking a little more joyful than others. If I could have the introvert corner calm down, just relax a little bit back there. You guys are a little hyper. Yeah, if you're ever here either before church or after church, you will see Stanton doing so much work around here and James being his, his happy elf assistant. <laughs> we were laughing about him this morning as we're thinking, you know, Stanton hasn't gotten here yet to move all the chairs a half inch in a different direction <laughs> so that it's perfect for all of you. But he does so much and we appreciate him so much. We're doing the book of 3rd John, which actually ties to our Advent theme of joy, but it also ties to a theme of welcome. And so we're going to be talking about that this morning. Oh, there's a familiar sight. Anybody recognize which movie? Okay, from uh, Christmas Carol. That's the 1951 version with Alistair Sim. Probably, I think, the best version of all of them. Although it's in a close tie with the Muppet version. I just... <laughs> I go back and forth all the time, you know, 51 was Sim, the Muppet version. I mean, in the Muppet version, you actually get Michael Caine being mean to a Muppet. And where else are you going to see that, you know, right? But this is the scene where the two solicitors come in. They're asking Scrooge for a donation. And one of the things they say is that, you know, at this time of year, at Christmas time, those in need feel those needs just a little bit more as they look out upon other people who have so much. And he says, and it's at this time of year that, that abundance rejoices and helps those in need. Of course, Scrooge will have none of it. But this ties into our theme about abundance rejoicing and about those in need as well. So in the book of Third John, it's not a very long book. It's another one of those really, really short books. So we get to do the whole thing today. It starts off with a greeting, the elder, which we now know as John. So oftentimes we refer to the author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John as John the Elder. Whether it was actually John the Beloved Disciple from the Gospel of John, we don't know. If it's the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, we don't know. But we refer to this particular writer as John the Elder. John was a very common name uh, in Greek. So we've, you know, anglicized it to John, but it, it was actually something else. Anyway, the Elder to the Beloved Gaius, who I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. One of the things I just like to point out about this greeting is that John is pointing out that everything is good for this individual spiritually, but he's also praying for his health and that it's okay to be concerned with the physical things. It's okay to receive prayer for your health, right? It's okay to pray for temporal things. That's not a bad thing. John is encouraging that. I think oftentimes when we come to prayer, we over-spiritualize it, and we forget it's okay to pray for the everyday, common, ordinary things. Now, this is the part that I like. Since this is the theme of joy, I'm about to tell you how to fill your pastor's heart with joy. And hopefully you can all do this. You want to make me overjoyed? And let me just give you, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not about writing a check. Okay, I know some pastors will get up there, especially televangelists that I can name, who say, write a big check and I'll be happy and you'll be blessed. No, it's not about that. Here's what John has to say. I was overjoyed when some of the friends arrived and testified to your faithfulness to the truth, namely how you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in in the truth. Nothing fills a pastor with more joy than to see church members walking in the truth. You know, every week we tend to get up here and we talk and we talk and we talk and we preach and we encourage and we conjole and we discipline and we yell and we do all kinds of stuff. But it fills us with joy when you take the lessons that we are teaching and you live them out and we see it and we hear from other people who say, Wow, there's something different going on there. My heart was filled with joy at Thanksgiving when I heard so many people talking about how welcome they feel when they come here. They talk about Tom makes them feel welcome. They talked about other people who makes them feel welcome. I'm like going, thank you, thank you. That is the lesson we are trying to teach. 
and you guys are doing it. And my heart was filled with joy. I will be filled with joy. I personally will be filled with joy when you walk in the truth that God is for you and not against you. If there's any one thing I can do, I mean, I can talk theology all day. Sit me down, I can talk theology all day. Probably tell you're so bored of it, you're like, oh, do we really need to get... But you know what's going to make me happy? Is that if you get this one truth into your head and you live it out, that God is for you and not against you. If you can reject all that nonsense teaching that is spewed out at you at a regular basis, that God is against you because of whatever reason and realize that he's for you completely, I will be filled with joy. And that you can walk in that and that you share that truth with other people. That if you can imitate that one truth and show it to other people, because that truly is what love is, is when you can go to any person and say, I am on your side. I will do whatever is best for you. I want what's best for you then I will be filled with joy because you are walking in the truth of love. John goes on to talk about some missionaries. As always, these letters were written because there's a problem. All churches have problems, except for dead churches. Dead churches have no problems. But all churches that are alive will have some kind of problem. There's always some little conflict or some little problem. And so he wrote this because there was a problem. He said, beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the friends. He's talking to, to Gaius. He's saying, hey, you're doing a great job. Even though they are strangers to you, they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on in a manner worthy of God. In other words, Gaius, as these traveling missionaries would come through to his hometown, he was inviting them into his home. He was taking care of them. He was making sure that when they left, they were well fed and well taken care of for the next leg of their journey. He was welcoming these strangers, these missionaries into his home. For they began their journey for the sake of Christ, accepting no support from non-believers. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we may become co-workers with the truth. One of the things John points out is, you know, there's a lot of people who are traveling around and they proclaim to do miracles. And there's these people who travel around, they're claiming to be prophets. There's all these itinerant people wandering around and they just take donations from anybody because they don't really care. They're just in it for the money. They're putting on a show. But he says, not these individuals. They're committed to Christ and they're not going to just take money just to take it. They don't take it from non-believers. They don't put on their show for non-believers. They're there to minister to fellow Christians and we need to be supporting them. And so he's commending uh, uh, Gaius for doing this. And he's saying, this is what we should be doing. You're doing it. Good job. So he's providing a welcome. He's providing hospitality. He's supporting to all the missionaries. And this is something that we need to do as well. That's one of the things that I'm very happy about ODM. We support a lot of different groups. And we know that these are groups that do good work without taking huge cuts of the profit, right? We, we help support love uh, uh, outreach. Uh, sorry, what is it? It's outreach, Christian outreach in action. I couldn't spit that one out. Let me try that again. Christian outreach in action, right? We go down to that church in 3rd and Linden. We cook meals. We serve. They're not making a profit on that. They're not collecting huge salaries and huge bonuses. And that's why we like to support them. Because we can see everything's going directly back out to the people who need it. We support, you know, the personal involvement center that Cedric's involved with. Cedric is one of our brethren. He is of good report. He walks in the truth. And he says, I need toys for the children. And look how you people respond. Fills my heart with joy. Because there's going to be a lot of families who are going to be able to come in and shop for Christmas. And their kids are going to have Christmas. This is what we need to be doing. Beware of frauds. John is going to warn them. Beware of frauds. Are there a lot of fraudulent people out there? Oh, you bet. There are a lot of people asking for your money. There's a lot of people soliciting donations. You can't walk through a parking lot nowadays without somebody. Are they frauds? I don't know. But we need to be careful. There's a lot of organizations out there that take huge cuts for themselves and give very little back to the community. Beware of rainmakers. You know what a rainmaker is? Oh, dear Lord. These are the professional, 
evangelists and preachers and whatnot, and they go from church to church, and they guarantee, you know, we'll come in, we'll do all these special offerings, and we'll cut a portion of the take with your church so that you guys can make some money. Okay? We don't invite those people here. We don't invite those people here. We're not going to bring in rainmakers to try to get money out of you so that we can get a cut of that. Recently, we had uh, Danny Cortez come and speak here for our Angora moms. The Angora moms wanted to host them. And one of the things they said to us, well, we'll give you a cut. And we're like, no, you won't. We will donate our space because we believe that you're helping the community. And because you're helping the community, everything should go to Danny and his ministry so he can continue. He's not a rainmaker, right? And we're not looking to just extort money from you somehow. Don't look for showmen. There are certain people who like to come in and they put on their big show. I don't know, how many of you remember, oh, this is so 80s. Okay, this is like reaching back before some of you were born, back in the 80s. Anybody remember the power team? Oh yeah, the big old wrestler guys, you know, oh. And they would, you know, put on handcuffs. And the guy would sit there and he'd quote scripture. This is showman's nonsense, right? And he's like, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can break these handcuffs through a verse, take it out of context, you know, <laughs> right? Rip phone books in half. Right? Those were just showmen raising money. You know who you really need to talk to? The hotel bellmen who carried their bags up to the room, who tell you stories of what was really going on in those hotel rooms at night. That if you knew what they were like away from that show stage, you would be amazed. Marjo, Marjo Goatner, there he is. Total showman. His parents raised him to be a showman. They took advantage of the evangelical circuit where you would travel around from church to church raising funds. Ordained as a pastor at age five, performed his first wedding ceremony at age five. Anybody ever read his autobiography? Oh my goodness, it's a tragic thing. His uh, parent, you know, supposedly he, moved by the Spirit of God, was doing all his preaching, but it was actually scripted by his father. His father scripted all his sermons. And to get him to learn them, his mother would have them repeat them over and over again. And if he messed up, she would literally hold his head in a bucket of water as punishment and then bring him back up. He was terrified as a youth, but he brought in a lot of money. And he was an adorable five-year-old, and he brought a lot of money in, but you know what the problem was? He grew up. He grew up. And he wasn't the cute, adorable, he wasn't a novelty anymore. And the money fell off, and he had a falling out with his parents. This is actually a picture taken from a film made in the 1970s, a documentary made in the 1970s. If you've never seen it, it's called Marjo. You should see it. Because he did something that was unforgivable. He allowed cameramen behind the scenes as he traveled the evangelical circuit, going from event to event, revival to revival. And he's got other revivalists on camera being themselves rather than their stage persona. And it's not a pretty picture. As you see a bunch of money-grubbing frauds Talk about different ways they extort money. Oh, have you tried this? Have you done this? Oh yeah, this really works. It's a, it's a great documentary, but you know, if you wanna see it or if you wanna read his autobiography, it's interesting reading. But these are not the people we should be welcoming to our church. These are not the people that we allow to stand before the congregation and teach them because their lives, their actions don't match up with their message. That is the hardest thing for us to do, especially as pastors, is that our lives have to match our message. We have to have a certain amount of integrity. That is why I tell you constantly, I am not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes because I, you know, I have to be honest about it. I have to have a certain amount of integrity. Otherwise, I can't stand up here. Oh, Phil Kidd. Mm. You know, the first time I heard a sermon by him, I thought it was satire. I thought it was a joke. And then I found out it wasn't. You can look up Phil Kidd and listen to some of his, and you're like, what? Seriously, he's joking, right? Even the Southern accent's real. I was like, really? 
Oh, Phil Kidd actually sends a letter to any church that's about to host him that explains to them how they should be treating all visiting pastors like him, all visiting speakers like him. And it includes the following things here, right? 10 things to do for your visiting pastor. Uh, if funds are tight, uh, start uh, taking special offerings ahead of time. Make sure the offering is going to be big enough because you don't want to give your visiting pastor a little offering, right? Uh, use the nicest motel. Never put preachers in the same motel as other guests. He'll have no privacy. Whatever happened to being a good guest and just accepting what you get? I mean, if the church is poor, are they going to go broke trying to put you up in a good hotel? Uh, have gifts for his wife and children to express gratitude for their sacrifice. Okay. Uh, mail his expense check prior to the meeting. Don't just divide his offering at the end of the meeting. Uh, at, all the love offerings should go to the preacher, uh, not after, uh, what is that? Motel and food uh, expenses deducted. In other words, you, you pay off his expenses and you give him all the love offering as well. Make your eating schedule fit his. Take him to restaurants he likes best. If, uh, if he flies in, don't let some retarded fruitcake pick him up at the, re at the airport and question him all the way to the motel. Ask for a rental car so I don't have to put up with it. Okay. If, he, if, he, if he flies in, then church should supply him a nice car so he's not uh, stranded at the motel. Don't run the preacher around all day and expect him to be prepared for the service. Be at his disposal and leave him alone. And number 10, ask if any of his clothes need to be dry cleaned. Uh, and many cleaners offer a one day service. Hmm. Sounds like he expects to be treated like a king and pampered. I think this guy's in it for the cash. What do you think? By the way, oh, there's a. Uh, blogger out there, his name is Bruce uh, Guerin, sir, and he's worked with Phil Kidd before. He was a uh, uh, independent fundamentalist Baptist preacher for a number of years, and he's walked away from that. And he says, many of these folks who travel around the revivalist cir circuit want to be paid in cash because they don't want to claim the taxes, and they even brag about not paying taxes on it. These are not the people who should be teaching. These are not the people we should be welcoming in because their life and their message don't match up. Anybody remember Goofus and Gallant? Who besides me remembers Goofus and Gallant? Anybody? Okay, that means you, your grandma gave you Highlights Magazine, right? Right, right? Grandma always sent you the little subscription to Highlights Magazine and they had Goofus and Gallant, right? Goofus, of course, is the rude one and Gallant's always the nice one. Goofus takes the big easy chair of head of his grandmother, but Gallant waits till his grandfather is seated, then chooses a chair. And it was to teach all of us how to be nice, right? How to be polite and all that kind of stuff. Well, in John's letter, we get a version of Goofus and Gallant, but it's got, it goes by different names here. It's Gaius and Diotrephenes, right? These two individuals, they treat the brethren very, very differently. So uh, Gaius walks in the truth and he welcomes the brethren. Good for him, okay? But Diotrephenes, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephenes who likes to put himself first does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing in spreading false charges against us and not content with those charges, he refuses to welcome the friends and even prevents those who want to do so and expels them from the church. This individual has elevated himself. He wants to be first in everything. He wants to be the one in control. He wants to be in charge. He wants to make the decisions. And I don't care if John the Elder, who oversees all the house churches around Ephesus, tells me that this person is a good person and that I should welcome him. I'm not going to welcome him. I mean, who's John anyway? And he starts spreading rumors about John and making up stories about John. He refuses to welcome the friends. And if anybody does it, he throws them out of the church. Don't be like him. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. 
Everyone has testified favorably about Demetrius. And this is the friend that John was sending along. John was sending a missionary along. He says, welcome Demetrius. I'm verifying, I'm vouching for him. He's, he's a good guy. And so has the truth itself. We also testify for him. And you know that our testimony is true. But Diotrephes would have nothing to do with him, refused to welcome him. And so John is writing this letter to Gaius to say, hey, when he comes, you welcome him. I'll take care of Diotrephanes. This is Diotrephanes. Diotrephanes doesn't respect elders. Diotrephanes doesn't welcome the brethren. Don't be like Diotrephanes. We need to be offering welcome to those whose words and message match up, to those who are of good testimony. Sincerely yours, I have much to write to you, but I'd rather not write with pen and ink. Instead, I hope to see you soon, and we'll talk together face to face. Peace to you. The friends send their greetings. Greet the friends there, each by name. And that's the end of 3 John. So how do we live this out? What are we supposed to do? When John's writing this letter, addressing this problem, what are we supposed to do? How should we be acting? Welcome those who have demonstrated in their life they walk in love. So when we invite people here to the church to speak, we invite people that we know are of good testimony. You know, we've had Kathy Baldock speak here several times. And we've always offered her a little something because she will literally travel anywhere at her own expense and she'll do it for free. And she has given back to the community so much. And she has dedicated her life to helping our community. And she is of good report. And so she is welcome to come here. She's welcome to stand in the pulpit and teach this church and teach the people here. We've welcomed Danny Cortez. We've welcomed others that we know are of good report. Walk in love. Welcome those who have demonstrated in their life that they walk in love. If they have not demonstrated this, if they're just some huckster, if they're just some showman, if they're just some rainmaker, we don't welcome those people here. Don't be taken in by those who have pretty words. There are a lot of people who have pretty words, who sound really great, but it's their life you have to examine. If their life and their words don't match up, those are not the people we support. Character does count. Character does count. We need to see people living out what they preach. We don't want to have hypocrisy. Ah, recognize those folks. Oh, they were a YouTube sensation for a while. Instagram, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. The story goes that the homeless guy there on the, what is that? The right, the left, the left, the long beard. The homeless guy gave his last $20 to the woman because she ran out of gas. And so she posted it on YouTube and Instagram and all this kind of stuff about, you know, what this, you know, this poor homeless guy, he was down to his last 20 bucks, but I needed gas and he gave it to me. What a great guy he is, all this kind of stuff. She started a GoFundMe campaign to help him out. And they raised literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then they were convicted of fraud because the couple had concocted the whole story and asked the homeless guy to help them out. And very little of the actual money raised went to him. They were spending it on new cars, a new BMW, yay, trips, clothes. So they created this entire fraud with a story that touched people's hearts. We need to be careful. This is the season when abundance rejoices. And I encourage you to look for those who are of good report. Look for those whose words and walk match each other. I have no problem working with Personal Involvement Center because Cedric's words and his walk match up. He is of good report. And I'm happy to do that anytime. We know Cedric, we know who he is. We know his heart. And that's why we encourage you as well, that those of you who know and are involved in other ministries, who are involved in other charities to come to us so that we can help support that as a community. 
because we want to make sure that in this time when abundance rejoices and need is keenly felt, that we are helping to meet that need. We want to be welcoming our brethren and helping them. That is how we live this out. But isn't it okay if I'm not doing good and not really hurting anyone? No, it's not okay. We are constantly called to be doing good. Kingdom. So go forward in joy. Go in peace. You are dismissed.